All right. Good evening and welcome everyone to our second of a two-part series of Japantown History with Dr. Meredith Oda, who is an historian and author of Gateway to the Pacific, Japanese Americans and the Remaking, a Remaking of San Francisco. And I want to mention that uh, tonight's program is co-sponsored by Ninja, the National Japanese American Historical Society. Um, before we begin, I just want to mention and take this moment to talk about a new program we're going to be launching this summer called J Talks, similar to TED Talks. But our idea is to bring entertaining, thought-provoking uh, online platform for Japanese American influencers, ed educators, creative thinkers, athletes, professional leaders, celebrities, and visionary, inspirational speakers to share their experiences, tell stories, and to inspire um, the Japanese American community. It's really an opportunity to showcase our, our talent and creativity and innovation as Japanese Americans. So we'll be launching that um, this summer. And I know Hanukkah's well on his way to uh, starting this program, even though I just told him about it tonight. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I'm really excited about tonight's presentation. Um, because it's a timely subject with Black Lives Matter movement, but also because um, for San Francisco, much of the um, movement for African Americans started in the Western edition. And I know Meredith will talk more about that. Um, but also it's, it's really a undocumented, um, unique history and relationship that Japanese, the Japanese American community shares with the Black community. And it's a unique, uh, relationship that is just not well known uh, because you can't find a lot of that stuff in history books or online. And, you know, it happened because of relocation and then migration during the war. And Meredith will talk more about that, but I'm excited about also though, I'm excited about it because, you know, I have a personal history, not only in my own work, um, but my, my father was um, on the original committee of Waco. Um, the Western Edition uh, Community Organization, which uh, he was one of the representatives from Christ United Presbyterian Church, because it started uh, with the religious leaders, uh, this movement, but it's really, Waco became a really important um, organization during redevelopment. Um, and I know, uh, I also read about it in your book, uh, Meredith, so I'm excited to hear more about that. So um, before we begin though, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and then why you wrote this book? Yeah, hi. Um, and uh, first let me just start first by saying thank you so much to Paul, you and um, Haruka Radabush for having me here and um, letting me talk about my book with people who probably have like you have a familiarity and an intimate history with, with the subject. Um, and so I, I myself, I'm um, a Yonsei um, from Philadelphia. So I'm not from the Bay Area at all. I'm from Philadelphia, suburban Philadelphia. Um, and um, ended up though interested in Japantown in the Western edition because I worked at, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, East Coast. There's not that many of us, or at least I certainly didn't feel like it when I was growing up. Sometimes it felt like I was the only one, <laughs> but that was clearly not true. Um, but yeah, so I worked in the, uh, in at Ninjas actually for a couple of years after college. So I had a lot of um, just kind of, you know, intimate everyday experiences with, with, with Japantown, with the Western edition, walking to and from Bard, I lived in the East Bay. Um, so I just kind of had a, had a lot of questions about, um, about the neighborhood, how it got to be the way it was, how it got to be so different from what I learned about in my Asian American studies classes. Um, so really, I just wanted to know kind of a little more about the neighborhood. And then when I got to grad school, I, I kind of had more academic tools to understand it because I was trained as an urbanist, so I um, was able to use kind of the tools that historians use to understand neighborhood change, race in cities, 
um, communities and cities. But I was interested in this subject because uh, the, the literature often speaks about it as this kind of black white dynamic. I think this is increasingly less the case now. There's some fabulous um, works on Latinx urbanism, for example. Um, but um, at the time when I was going through graduate school, which was now decades ago, um, there just wasn't that much outside of that black white binary. So I was interested in kind of Japantown just seemed like the perfect case study to understand kind of race, neighborhood change in a different framework. Okay. Um, you know, without um, further ado, I'd like to um, thank Dr. Meredith Oda coming and talking about uh, Japanese and, and African Americans in the Western edition and redevelopment. So Dr. Oda, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Oops. And I have a bunch of slides, of course. So you don't have to just stare at my face <laughs> through the whole time. Um, okay, so today I'm going to um, thank you all so much to not only to the center, but all of you who came out um, to to gather together this evening virtually, unfortunately. Um, but I know we've had a, over a year of Zoom, we're all very tired of it. So I really appreciate you fighting through that Zoom fatigue and, and coming here today. Um, so tonight I'm gonna to talk about Japanese Americans and African Americans in um, Japantown in the Western edition, especially the very parallel actions that members of the two communities took um, but the diverging views of African Americans and Japanese Americans that emerged in the development process um, from the 1960s through the 1970s. So I'm going to begin with some background first with an introduction to the framework of um, Japantown's, Japantown's redevelopment, kind of what I call San Francisco's post-war Trans-Pacific urbanism. And I went into this a little bit if you were here for the April talk, I know not all of you were, but I'll briefly sketch out the importance of Japan for San Francisco's economy, politics, and civic identity in the post-World War II years. And then I'll turn to um, the commemoration of that kind of fascination with Japan in the Japanese Cultural and Trade Center, as it was called at the time, um, a three block mall built by the city's redevelopment program. So the center was the celebration of the city's ties with Japan just carved into the city's built environment. And then in the third and kind of the biggest portion of my talk, I'll look at the very real consequences and the responses of that celebration of Japan on Western edition residents' daily lives. And most pointedly, the displacement and disruption that was hidden by the celebrations um, of the Japanese center. Um, and then specifically those who struggled against that displacement, against that public cost, that intimate cost at times, um, the J Japanese American developers, African American developers, Japanese American protesters, African American protesters, um, all of whom kind of struggled in very similar and parallel ways to kind of carve out a space for themselves um, within and in some cases against the celebration of Japan that was embodied by the Japanese center. Um, and however, though, the successes that all of these groups and individuals had, and all of them had to varying degrees, um, in that their success in reshaping their city's redevelopment program depended very much on their purchase with the, the city's Japanese um, relations and ambitions. So as we'll see, even though all of these folks together um, we're working, and sometimes in conjunction, we're working toward the common goal of community maintenance and control. Japanese American developers had opportunities for participation and cooperation with the city in ways that cohered with their identities um, as Japanese Americans with the city's Trans-Pacific urbanism. And even though African American African American developers and protesters adopted similar goals and strategies as their Japanese American counterparts, they were often associated with protests and needs, which narrowed their possibilities um, for cooperation and even for um, kind of an audience with the city and municipal officers. <clears throat> 
So everyone though, as we'll see, found themselves in some ways limited by the constraints of their city's trans-Pacific rather than local aims. And as Paul said, I think this does have um, a, a lot of resonance for us today because um, as, as we can see with the Black Lives Matter movement, anti-hate protest organizations and activists, there is a lot of right collaboration and cooperation and alliances made. I mean, I think by looking back at kind of the ways in which people both work together, but also were in some ways kind of separated by um, public assumptions or by municipal cooperation or varying levels of um, kind of acceptance, we can see ways in which or specific um, kind of barriers to kind of intersectional alliances that developed in the Western addition redevelopment. Again, despite the fact that there were activists both working in parallel and also in some cases together. Okay, so I'll turn with, I'll start with a little backstory, kind of fill in a little bit um, about what I started saying in answer to Paul's question. Um, because I came to the story again years and years ago when I was working in Japantown. So right after college, I graduated from Berkeley um, and I got this job with ninjas. I was an Asian American studies minor. I was really interested in working in the community. And of course, I'm a historian now. So I was just really interested in history. So ninjas, the National Japanese American Historical Society was like the perfect home. And it was, I loved working there. Um, but in my time working there, and this was in what the, late 1990s, early aughts, it looked about, Japantown looked about like what it does today, um, you know, about like this. However, as I knew, as I mentioned, I knew from my Asian American studies classes that it had been the Japanese ghetto, right, for most of the 20th century or at least for the first half of the 20th century, right? So it was poor, it was segregated, mostly renters, few property owners, and for the most part, people living in the kinds of decrepit apartments and flats minimally maintained by absentee landlords. So how did we get from that, right? An ethnic enclave, an ethnic ghetto to this kind of modernist mall. <laughs> um, where were the Japanese American residents? Where did they go? And so I therefore came to my book the way that many historians come to their studies, which is from questions and observations around about the spaces around around us um, or around me, the spaces and the people around me. Um, so I was really interested. It started in some ways like this kind of tiny micro study of really these three blocks, but Japantown more, more broadly. But as I researched the project and therefore the book became kind of bigger and bigger and bigger um, thematically, but also geographically, because really I found I needed to understand U.S. Japanese relations, decolonization in the Pacific, Japanese domestic retail regulations, Chinese refugee migration to the U.S. and the Black freedom struggle in the West, as well as post-war urban policy or Japanese American history to really understand why this neighborhood changed in the way that it did. So the story of, you know, the few blocks that I wandered around in for a bit after college became the story of a city, San Francisco, kind of collectively, definitely not cooperatively, though, struggling with regional competition, right, with LA, with Seattle, but responding to opportunities both in its backyard, right, within its own neighborhoods and streets, as well as far away, right, across the Pacific, in Hawaii or in Japan, and redefining its place in a global economy and politics and transforming its buildings, its streets, its homes, its very civic identity in order to do so. And that surprised me in some ways, right? Because I thought of, like many of us do, as cities as kind of the very prototypical definition of local, right? When we think about local, we think cities, we think neighborhoods. Urban issues involve things like streets, infrastructure, zoning, parking meters, buildings, people, identities, homes, um, right? All of which come up in my book, including a fascinating discussion of parking meters. Who would have thought parking meters are, are interesting? But, well, I found that they were they actually tell us kind of a lot. Um, but this tiny scale, right, that seems like the polar opposite of global. But I found that these that foreign relations, ideas about Japan, networks and connections with Japan were simply popping out of my sources. Um, 
people, civic leaders, everyday ordinary San Franciscos were talking about Japan. Events were created around these trans-Pacific ties and they were celebrated at every level of city life. So, and here's one example. So this is um, the annual three-day Pacific festival in 19, oops, and this is the festival in 1960. Um, and at which we can see these Japanese cadets of the merchant marine ship um, docked in San Francisco Harbor were the honored guests of this whole Pacific festival. And here they are, of course, in costume, um, you know, in sort of feudal costume, parading by the um, show stand with the mayor. He's the tall white guy in the sort of center of the of the stand, flanked by um, the police department, the police chief, the fire chief, and so forth. Um, and so this was a festival, and this was an annual festival that went on for years, a specific festival that was there to celebrate, that was launched uh, just the year before 1959 to celebrate San Francisco's place as the gateway for trade, communication, and, trans or, and transportation with the Pacific nations. So the moniker of the gateway to the Pacific was this ubiquitous, phrase in San Francisco in the 1950s and 60s. You really, I just found it everywhere. Um, on the cover of phone books and municipal reports, on chamber of commerce publications, festival banners, um, student events. But this gateway, San Francisco, the gateway to the Pacific was much more than just a nickname. It was really a kind of imaginative geography, right? Like a, a way of thinking about the city in, in the world. Um, by mapping out the city as the kind of hub, the center of the Pacific region. Um, and so as one Chamber of Commerce representative put it during a trip that he took to Japan as part of a cohort to Japan, um, as he said, growth in Japan means growth in our, means growth for San Francisco. So connecting, right, the economic growth of Japan to his city. Um, and this is because from about 1956 on, Japan's economy was really bursting at the seams, according to Time Magazine. Um, and this was an unequal Japanese boom, again, in the words of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and this was really good news for San Francisco, for a, a city long connected, right, to Asian trade and transportation networks. Um, so again, as the Chamber of Commerce said, with Japan buying the San Francisco Bay Area, the gateway to the Orient prospers. So very much city, um, at least city business leaders were connecting their city's fortunes with that of Japan and seeing Japan's rise as kind of bring, rising their ship too. There were roadblocks, of course, though, to this optimism. In the same breath that the chamber is sort of lauding Japan's growth and its prospects for San Francisco, the chamber is also, annou also announced that other ports along the coast, right, LA, Seattle, have been overtaking what it colorfully called the aging matron of the Pacific Basin. So San Francisco had been the primary Western West Coast hub for um, West Coast port city in the late 19th century through the early 20th, but its place by the 1950s was now decades overshadowed by other coastal rivals, rivals particularly Los Angeles. And so San Francisco's trans-Pacific urbanism um, originated in municipal officials and business leaders' efforts to make their city attractive to their desired Japanese um, economic and political relations. So, or, but what began as the interest of just a handful of mostly business leaders in the mid 1950s evolved into this kind of larger, what I call trans Pacific urbanism that characterized San Francisco as a whole after World War II. And so, here when I say that phrase, I'm borrowing from sociologist Lewis Worth's idea of urbanism. He calls urbanism, um, and he's kind of like an old school 1950s urbanist um, sociologist. And he calls urbanism a way of life that distinguishes cities right, as social, economic, cultural, political holes, you know, a kind of urbanity, right, when we say somebody is urbane, they're kind of sophisticated, um, they're cosmopolitan, so an urbanity in both senses of, of the word, right, both urban, but also this kind of sophisticated cosmopolitan, um, self-conscious, self-consciously so, right, that contextualized and facilitated the city's economic and political connections with Japan with historical precedent and popular support. So 
you know, just to break it down, when I say transpacific urbanity, we can see it in many different forms. It had a lot of different expressions. So for example, you could see it in shifts among city leadership, right? As city leaders, like the mayor, Mayor Christopher in this photograph, um, even his staff, his aides, the ones who have to do all of his correspondence work or like set up meetings, right? They all became much more attuned to working with Japanese counterpart parts over these decades just by dint of experience. Um, there was new municipal institutions like the sister city relationship with Osaka, the now defunct one with Osaka developed in 1957. Um, you could see it in extended employment opportunities, particularly for those who could work at the junction of Japanese and US interests. And then finally, in celebrations like this parade, this festival, that suggested popular support. In this case, 10,000 San Franciscans came out to see the parade and to cheer on the marchers. Um, so it takes many forms. It takes sort of personal um, relationships with Japanese counterparts. It takes a different point of view um, about this, you know, fairly recent enemy, um, but most intimately felt were transformations in the built environment, in the landscape of the city that demanded changes in where and how people lived. So now then I'll turn to the second part of my talk, which is um, focusing on the Japanese cultural and oops, went the wrong way, the Japanese cultural and trade center, which was kind of the crown jewel of the city's Trans-Pacific urbanism. So built between 1960 and 1968, I'm sure I, it seemed like a lot of you are from the Bay Area or San Francisco. So this is probably a familiar landmark to you. Um, and it was built as part of the city's redevelopment program in the Western Edition District with Japanese American and Japanese investment. This was designed to be this kind of marketplace of Japanese industry, of commerce and culture. It had shops, displays of Japanese products. You could go and see Honda cars before they were too common on you know, American roads, Japanese restaurants, Japanese banks. The Japanese consulate was located there. That was this building here. Um, and artistic cultural displays, historical displays and so forth. So at a time when urban renewal programs right, federally backed urban renewal programs were still relatively young. City officials claimed this was the first example of international investment in an American redevelopment program. Um, so a really proud um, example of the city's Trans-Pacific links. So its developer was a Japanese American banker from Honolulu, Masayuki Tokioka, who brought in who went to Japan and brought in three Japanese companies as investors and major tenants. There was a, Jap a department store and transportation conglomerate, a theater company for entertainment, and then a restaurant for um, the major Japanese food enterprise, um, as well as smaller retailers and industries. So the center then kind of was productive of all of these new links with networks with Japanese capital, goods, businesses, people, politics, and so forth. Um, and it was also evident in its design, right? So the architect was Minoru Yamasaki, envisioned, you know, Nisei architect, also built the World Trade Center in New York City. Um, and he envisioned it as very much a hybrid of US and Japanese design, right? So he brought in these exaggerated roof lines, um, visible framing, um, sort of design and function, functional framing that was meant to kind of echo in some ways a kind of shoji screen motif. The centerpiece of the center was this peace pagoda, um, a modern interpretation of a 16th century Japanese temple, all made with what the architect, what Yamasaki called American engineering and modern materials like concrete or plate glass. Um, so all the traces of the city's Trans-Pacific urbanism then was on display at the Japanese Center opening ceremonies in March 1968. So I'm going to show a little footage from that opening. And this is footage from a local news station, KPIX. You guys are probably still familiar with that too. It's not an original story. It's just kind of footage that um, the videographer had taken at the, at the ceremonies and then was later used bits and pieces of it for the actual newscast. Um, but it's you can find it at... Um, San Francisco State has this really good news archive that you can sort of find all sorts of stuff, um, video feed from all sorts of, of topics. 
But here is the one that documented the center's opening ceremonies. out of what was an ugly ghetto. And we pay due respect on this occasion to the people here in San Francisco of the new and national Great nation and of the living testament to the strength of Japanese American friendship. World and Trade Center. Developed by National Grey Mine, our granddaughter of Mr. Ishizaka will now unveil the plaque, which will be permanently affixed this summer to the 135 great industrial reorganizations in the history of the world. Today, as Perhaps Mayor Alioto's comment would perhaps Mayor Alioto's comment was most representative of the feeling here today. Here, where once there was poverty and despair, there is now a thing of beauty, a place unique in our country. Belva Davis for Eyewitness News. Oops. Okay, so um you can see just, I mean, it's always kind of fun to see what the building actually looked like at the time. And um, so as you can see from the film though, the ceremony really celebrated the Japanese ties that had helped to build the center. So the speaker here was the Japanese ambassador to Shimoda. Um, we also see the Reverend from the Konko Church in San Francisco, um, Japanese tenants, representatives of the Japanese tenant companies and investors were there, um, as well as both California and Japanese officials, so mayors, state representatives, ambassadors um, from both the United States and Japan were, um, were on the stage. Um, and of course, we saw women in kimonos, um, including Japanese JAL, Japan Airlines um, flight attendants. And here's one carrying the flame from the Todaiji Temple in Japan that went on to set um, the flame, the eternal flame. I, I don't think it's there anymore, so it wasn't an eternal flame, but it was meant to be an eternal flame in that um, Japanese center courtyard. So the ceremony itself and the center itself was very much this kind of celebration of the city's networks with Japan, right? Economic, political, but also diasporic. So the center was as much a celebration of Japanese Americans as Japan. So the 1200 or so Japanese Americans who lived in San Francisco by about 1970, which is you know naturally a tiny segment of the over about 700,000 San Franciscans total. Um, but nonetheless, that small segment of the population was very much kind of also on display, but part of the celebrations here and part of what was celebrated. So Japanese Americans were in fact key to the center's success. Um, as well as the Trans-Pacific celebration that it represented. So in addition to Japanese representatives, there was also a multitude of Japanese American ones. So the developer, the, there was two Japanese American architects, um, Japanese American legal representatives and others who helped to build the Japanese center. So Japanese Americans were important um, on a symbolic level, right? They were, this was their enclave. This, the location of the Japanese center was chosen as the Japantown neighborhood. 
Right. But that was part of what Aliota had called, we heard him say, the ugly ghetto that had once stood at the center site and the surrounding Western Edition area. So this location in Japantown gave the center a kind of logic, right, in the built environment, the, the home, the sort of natural home, as um, city officials like to say, for um, this celebration of Japan, right? The decades old home of the Japanese diaspora in San Francisco, they were themselves a link to Japan. So of course, naturally, right? The center was built there to add cultural and historic context to the city's economic and political ties. And Japanese Americans were important sort of um, as proxies for Japan. So a lot of the women in kimonos at the ceremonies, um, were themselves Japanese Americans. There was a parade after this um, that included a lot of Japanese dancers, all of whom were themselves Japanese American as well. So, um, and on a practical level too, Japanese American participation was simply key because as property owners, business owners, patrons, renters in the surrounding area, they were materially important to the center's success. The Japanese center was surrounded by the many Japanese American shops, restaurants, and residents, including those of the Nihonmachi area just directly to the north, right, the Buchanan Plaza area. So these local Japanese American retailers too contributed to the opening of the center. They put up banners, hung carp streamers from light fixtures, um, put up posters in their windows, um, and organized the three-day cherry blossom festival that marked the center's opening, the first cherry blossom festival um, of San Francisco's history that, you know, is now an ongoing um, celebration to this day. So all of this helped to then contextualize and ground the center's proclaimed links to Japan right in this um, Japanese American community. So Japanese American participation was therefore extensive in the center, in its celebration and so forth. But as much as city officials, even some Japanese Americans themselves tried to um, demonstrate it or argue it or frame it as kind of natural, as organic. Of course, Japanese Americans would celebrate, would be part of the celebration of Japan, um, this foreign nation in their city. It was actually not at all natural or organic, right? And in fact, to come out of the struggles of Japanese Americans to maintain some semblance of Japantown and the homes and businesses it represented for them. And so now we'll turn to some of the costs of the city's celebration of Japan um, to better understand Japanese American and African Americans role in the city center and the city's trans-Pacific ambitions. So the Japanese, oops. So the Japanese center, and this is an, an image of the Japanese center itself, uh, or the lot that would become, you know, the torn up lot that would become the Japanese center. Um, and the Japanese center's five acres cut Japantown in half. According to the Nietzsche Bay Times, um, while the larger Western Nation Redevelopment Program displaced thousands of Japanese American residents, um, many multi-generational businesses were forced to move or were lost entirely. The Fuji Hotel, which was a longtime residential hotel, Post Pool Hall, Nakagawa Apartments, Capital Laundry, Keek Smoke Shop. All of these were longtime Japanese American run businesses, as well as all the residents who lived on the lot, um, right, were forced to move, evicted for the Japanese center itself. So, and you know, of course, this was this was hard. This was damaging. Property owners fumed at what they saw as the city's meager offers on their buildings or land. Right there, they had to move for um, for this development. Therefore, the city offered them um, some what they valued as the cost. But it was very rarely both. Um, you know, very rarely aligned with the owner's actual assumptions of the cost or renters' assumptions of the costs of their, their building. So while renters faced a tight housing market in which anti-Asian segregation still limited their options, um, owners then also faced this loss of, of wealth that their buildings have represented. So in the face of all this upheaval, right, bulldozers tearing down buildings, people losing their homes and businesses, residents wondered whether Japantown was just, in the words of the Nietzsche Bay Times, just doomed for complete destruction. Most Japanese Americans had of course lived through the Western edition incarceration. This is in the 1960s, 
right here around 1960, late 1950s, early 19, oh, this is in 1964. Um, so, you know, that was only 20 years ago that Japanese Americans had lived through the incarceration and had only, you know, fairly recently rebuilt um, and, you know, were very much aware of the fact that their rights um, were delicate, were tenuous. So dozens of property owners and proprietors hinged their futures, therefore, on the center's success, um, right? Seeing it as kind of a last resort. So now we'll turn to the first group of Japanese Americans struggling to reshape the city's trans-Pacific urbanism and remember those that the Japanese center forgot. So in other words, kind of ameliorate some of the consequences. Um, okay, so organized by a lawyer, and this is M. Justin Herman, he was a director of the Redevelopment Agency, oops, along with members of the Nihonmachi Community Development Corporation. And so organized by Victor Abe, who lived and worked in Japantown, a group of Japanese American merchants and property owners had attempted to join the redevelopment program shortly after the first plans were announced. This was in 1953. Um, and indeed, it had been in an iteration of Abe's group who had first suggested the whole idea of a Japanese themed mall for the Western edition, um, which is a whole separate story to city officials. Um, and in 1953, in the early 1950s, they weren't successful. But that left them with a determination, right, not to be bulldozed out when a subsequent redevelopment proje project threatened, as the Nietzsche Bay, Nietzsche Bay Times wrote, much of what remains of the city's Nihonmachi in 1960. So in 1964 then, incorporated as the Nihonmachi Community Development Corporation or the NCDC, the group of Japanese American merchants and property owners secured a two block development just north of the of the center, right, Nihonmachi, that's the area around the Buchanan Mall, um, in the midst of the Japanese center's development. And this was, of course, a much smaller scale. This was two blocks as opposed to the Western editions or the Japanese center's three, um, and just on a much smaller scale in general. Um, but it was a two block pedestrian mall, right, that would hold shops, office spaces, apartments, restaurants. I'm sure you're familiar with it if you've been there. Um, and the project offered residents and proprietors a chance, right, that they had missed out on in the Japanese center site, which was um, a chance to have control over this parcel of land that was, of course, just a small piece of what had been a much larger Jap Japantown area. Um, but the project offered these residents, proprietors, the chance to buy into this corporation, the um, development corporation, and bid on a property, um, part a parcel of um, the project's area. And if you couldn't buy a parcel or you didn't want to, you could still buy a $100 membership to be a part of the corporation and right, have some say, have a vote in the development's direction. So Nihonmachi Corporation then secured in 1964 in their agreement with the city what members had not been able to do in the past when they had first tried or suggested that Japanese themed mall in 1953. Those with capital, and of course that's a small minority, um, could remain in Japantown or at least have some say in its future, right? Something long desired by Victor Abe and his groups of merchants and property owners. And this included people who had been displaced by the Japanese center. This included the, um, the NCDC's president, Mash Ashizawa, the former proprietor of Soko Hardware. But by 1964, the group had found much more traction, right? They were successful because they now had traction. They had sway with the city to some degree. Um, not only had they been communicating with the redevelopment agency over the course of that decade, right, they could now also point to justification for the develop of the development of the center itself and the trans-Pacific urbanism that it represented. So in 1964, the center was still years from from completion, but it was planned as the anchor of the neighborhood. So Nihonmachi members could frame their project as a community extension of the center. As Victor Abe insisted, this was a representation that all the members of the Nihonma, of the Japanese community were wholeheartedly behind the center. So by, they kind of supported publicly and visibly and vocally um, the building of the Japanese center. And this support was in fact critical because the city's trans-Pacific urbanism also needed Japanese American support, right? The center's 
celebration of Japanese Americans would ring hollow if actual Japanese Americans themselves didn't show up to be enthusiastic supporters, right? So the Japanese Americans, the Japanese center helped to create a kind of mutual need between city officials and between their sort of trans-Pacific aims and between Japanese Americans one that offered the members of the Nihon Machi Corporation an opportunity for some degree of community control and maintenance. Um, and of course there were costs, right? In some ways, this is a bit of a deal with the devil. A number of businesses that were in the area didn't fit in to the Trans-Pacific urbanism of the Japanese center and Nihon Machi as planned. And so they ended up excluded, right? Businesses like Yamato's Garage, a bait shop of the pool hall, smoke shops. These were not recognizably Japanese in theme, even though they had served the Japanese American residents for decades. Um, and they also just didn't have the capital or the resources to invest in Nihon Machi. And similarly, poor residents had no place in the market, ra market rate residential projects um, of the Nihon Machi area. So this trans-Pacific urbanism then that the Japanese center celebrated offered some opportunities for those who could adapt to its framework, right, to its trans-Pacific sort of Japanese themed framework, but also helped to winnow out and exclude and displace those businesses and residents who couldn't, right, who couldn't adapt to that framework. Um, and so what this did was it heightened the public image of Japanese Americans as successful, as naturally and inherently connected to Japan, um, and invested at least a public, visible, somewhat more elite and privileged sector of the community into the city's trans-Pacific urbanism. But there was also another critical service that the Nihonmachi group played towards the Japanese center's success. And that was, it could demonstrate, or it could allow the city to deflect criticism of the destructive consequences of redevelopments of the redevelopment program, right? So as elsewhere, eviction, property seizures in the blighted neighborhood of the Western Edition led to the dispersal of the largely non-white and low-income residents and businesses of the district. In the Western edition, among those hardest hit were low-income African Americans. Black removal, as one activist, Mary Rogers, called it, echoing a common reproach um, by redevelopment critics nationally. Other residents, academics, community leaders, even federal oversight authorities had criticized San Francisco's for its handling of resident rehousing. And community organizers decried the lack of attention to low income and segregated residents in San Francisco as elsewhere. So Japanese American participation gave the redevelopment agency then a non white group from the redeve redevelopment agency to point to in response to these criticisms right a kind of model minority group. And we can see that even here in the rede in the redevelopment map. Um, so officials could point to the Japanese civic and business representatives who cooperated with um, the agency in developing suitable plans for a four block area. So here, Nihon Machi. And this allowed the redevelopment agency to claim that it worked with residents to encourage and assist them in assuming the role of redevelopment redevelopers in their own area. Um, so, you know, of course, the Nihon, Ma the members of the Nihon Machi Corporation, they had struggled against the forgetting of the Japanese American residential and business community displaced by the Japanese center. Um, this was a product of struggle, right? But their cooperation also allowed the city to elide the damage to the Western edition, Black community in particular, and the low income and poor community more broadly, which of course included some, many Japanese Americans. Um, okay, so because perhaps the most glaring omission of the Japanese center and its celebrations of trans-Pacific ties were the hundreds of Japanese American residents who had been uprooted from that very site, from the Japanese center's site, and the thousands that were displaced by the larger Western Edition redevelopment project. So while Japanese Americans were celebrated as these links to Japan, African Americans were completely absent from the celebrations. 
So the Japanese center then represented a very selective commemoration because while the Japanese center sat, yes, in a decades old Japanese enclave from 1942 on from the Japanese American eviction from the West Coast on, Japantown was a part of, a big part of black San Francisco. Um, after Japanese Americans had been forced into incarceration camps, thousands of African Americans from the South moved in as they sought out jobs in the Bay Area's wartime industry and an escape from the Jim Crow South. So poet Maya Angelou, who lived in the neighborhood for part of her youth, described this process. Um, as she says, the Japanese shops which sold products to Nisei customers were taken over by enterprising Negro businessmen and in less than a year became permanent homes away from home for the newly arrived Southern Blacks. The Japanese area became San Francisco's Harlem in a matter of months. And here this picture is of a Black-owned club, one of the many Black-owned businesses in the area and part of the thriving jazz scene that flourished here. Um, along Fillmore Street, but also along Post Street in what we now think of as, Jap as Japantown. Um, so by the 1960s, about 14,000 African-Americans lived in the Western Edition, only about 20% of Black San Francisco more broadly. Um, most African-Americans in the city lived in the Hunters Point District, but this was the largest Black community in the center part of the city. So Black residents were the Western Edition's biggest group of color after World War II. Um, and even after World War II, what was called Japantown or Japanese town or Nihonjin Machi was home to almost as many African Americans as Japanese Americans. So when the, cent the city decided to erect a Japanese center in the Western edition, city officials were making a choice. They were making a selection. They were just making a decision to ignore the larger African-American history of the neighborhood, the larger African-American history and population of the neighborhood by filtering who to celebrate and how. So intentionally forgetting those who were not a part of the city's trans-Pacific vision, guiding the center and contemporary city ambitions. But of course, just like the Japanese Americans who are cooperating with the Japanese center, black Western edition residents too wanted to fight displacement, protect their community, shape their city's future and undoubtedly profit right from the root from the pro project in different ways. But without the revitalized and kind of revalued racialized identity, the Japanese Americans had that now aligned with the city's trans-Pacific urbanism, African-American San Franciscans just didn't have the advantages offered to Japanese Americans. So instead, African-Americans had to turn to alternative methods to protect their community and enact their own visions of city life. So like activists elsewhere, Black activists in San Francisco struggled against displacement using direct action protest and nonviolent civil disobedience rather than cooperation or, um, or negotiation, or maybe in addition to cooperation and negotiation. So we can see this in the group, um, the Western Edition Community Organization, the pin that um, Paul had from his father, which is fantastic. You've had such fabul fabulous um, artifacts from my talk, from my talks. So Waco was formed, the Western Edition Community Organization, Waco, or sometimes as its critics very creatively called it, Waco. Um, the group formed in 1967 to bring this district's residences, residents, businesses, pre-existing groups and institutions together to oppose the current renewal program and its displacement of residents. So as stated by Hannibal Williams, a local church elder, former member of the Black Student Union at San Francisco State and president of the group, residents were tired of being buffeted around like chess pieces. So members protested, used direct action, um, public protest to display, to protest the displacement of residences and residents and businesses, especially black residents and businesses. So at one event, 60 residents stormed the mayor's office chanting, we are going to stop redevelopment. We are going to see the mayor. Um, the group organized residents and allies for mass participation at Board of Supervisor or Redevelopment Agency Commission meetings. Um, at least one meeting went on to become this 12 hour all night marathon that extended after daybreak as activists kind of pressed and probed this, the commission members 
with questions about residents' futures. So activists, and then activists also picketed projects like the one above here, right, to stop demolitions or constructions, which they actually did here in this particular protest. Um, but of course, protest wasn't their only tool. As well known as they were at the time for these very visible demonstrations, protests was by no means their only tool. They were very savvy about media attention and knowing when and how to politic. So for example, they met with redevelopment agency officials, right? Sitting down with Justin Herman and his staff. They politicked with political candidates and supervisors. They sent out petitions and most dramatically, Waco members led a lawsuit that resulted in a temporary injunction on resident relocation and funding. The first time they claimed that a court had issued such an injunction on a redevelopment program anywhere in the country. So this in turn, this was a tremendous legal victory. And this in turn, um, as much as the protests or along with the protests, right, led to their participation in the redevelopment process itself. It forced the redevelopment agency to create a project area committee headed by most of Waco's leadership, which could then determine project acceptance and parameters. So a really big win, it gave them quite a say. Um, not necessarily what Nihonmachi community or the Nihonmachi Corporation got, but nonetheless, Waco's victory definitely achieved a measure of resident input, right? It put Waco members on into seats of power in the redevelopment agency on both its board as well as on its staff. Um, so in a lot of ways, they helped to recalibrate anti-redevelopment grassroots activity in San Francisco, though, as Black protest. That was what they became famous for. Um, and this was the case, right? So redevelopment response, Black redevelopment response then was understood as Black protest. Again, despite the fact that these all sorts of tactics and as Paul pointed out, that there was a very diverse constituency and membership in Waco itself. There were Japanese Americans, there were Chinese Americans, there were white people on Waco's board. Nonetheless, coverage of Waco, publicity of Waco, often tended to um, foreground the organization as a voice of Black protest. Um, and again, so response to Western addition redevelopment was often seen as Black protest. And this was the case despite the fact that some Black entrepreneurs and institutions, in fact, had the means and the instinct to cooperate with the city's redevelopment program, including the project pictured here um, and the subject actually of Waco's protests in the previous pictures, um, the Martin Luther King Square apartments. And this was the first project built by a Black entrepreneur in the Western edition, Ulysses Montgomery and his group, the Fillmore Community Development Corporation. Um, you know, a name, of course, that almost exactly mirrors the Nihonmachi Corporation. And it was enthusiastically heralded by officials when it was announced, um, right at a time when redevelopment was criticized as quote unquote, Negro removal. So the MLK part apartments had comfortable quarters, attractive landscaping, children's playgrounds, plus over 30% or 30% of the apartments were set aside for low income residents um, and included priorities for black workers and training in its development. So the experience and trust also garnered from the city officials also garnered Montgomery springboard into a lifelong career in real estate development. So in many ways we can look at it as a very successful project. But like the other residential projects developed at the time by Black institutions, the project focused on need, right? Very real needs, setting aside low income housing in a way that, for example, the Nihonmachi development did not. And so made it a more limited example of Black success for city officials, right? To tout than say the Nihonmachi project. And so, and of course, Martin Luther King Square didn't resonate with the city's cohering Trans-Pacific urbanism. Um, and then finally, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly go over a small group of Japanese American protesters who similarly resonated at the time, but not enough to kind of throw off the balance of the Nihonmachi um, publicity. So there was a, a small group of Japanese American protesters. So despite the city's proclaiming of cooperation with the Japanese American community, there was of course a very vociferous, robust protest movement from Japanese Americans against redevelopment. This particular group emerged in 1972. Um, so a number of Japanese American residents, just to say, had protested the Western Edition redevelopment in various ways since its origins in 1947, right? Gone to the meetings, protested it, 
said, you know, testified to why it was going to be harmful. But um, the most public one came out here with Kane in 1973. So this is a young, a group of young Sansei Japanese Americans um, that organized as the Committee Against Nihonmachi Eviction to protest displacement and redevelopment through militant and direct action tactics. So Kane had come out, Kane as it was called, came out of the Asian American movement of the late 1960s and were very much inspired by the black protest or the black power movement, right? So they sought to stop the dispersal and destruction of the Japanese community carried on by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. And to them, this was a process with historical precedent. So during the war, when activists wrote, we were rounded up and relocated into America's prisoner of war camps. In 1958, once again, San Francisco Japanese were faced with relocation, this time at the hands of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. So these activists focused, focused much like Waco did and much like Montgomery had done on need in Japantown, right? They reached out to people who were faced with eviction um, and without a stake in either the Nihonmachi or the Japanese Center Project, right? Renters, low income renters, small business owners, and used militant direct action tactics to try to prevent their displacement. So in this picture, you can see um, Kane protesters confronting police officers to stop the eviction of a Nihonmachi tenant. And just like Waco, you can also see that this is also an interracial movement or an interracial organization, not just Japanese American. And in another action, nine activists chained themselves together and conducted a two hour sit in at the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency office. They padlocked doors to prevent potential developers from viewing properties, staged rallies at demolition sites. Um, in any number of ways created a very visible protest of the redevelopment process and its consequences for low income, in particular low income segregated residents. So by focusing on Japantown's needy then, Kane protesters also criticized the Trans-Pacific ambitions of the city, right? Over and above an attention to city residents. Kane activists viewed the lore of Japanese investment, right? All the Japanese capital that was a part of the Japanese center with suspicion. They saw those very corporations, those Japanese corporations as outside, um, interlopers as any others with corrosive influences. All right, so to conclude then, the city's Trans-Pacific Urbanism and the Japanese Center highlighted Japanese American contributions and cooperations by celebrating them and monumentalizing them in the city's built environment. And in contrast, African Americans were excluded from any analogous commemoration in city life. So even with the limited success of MLK Square and other residential projects um, built by Black institutional developers, um, Western edition participation highlighted need and assistance as much as black entrepreneurism, right? With, with um, um, you know, responsibly so, right? Highlighting the displacement that redevelopment cost the local community. So giving it though a less celebratory, giving re redevelopment a less celebratory, more challenged ring for city officials. Um, and okay, so, and of course, there was many reasons that Black San Franciscans were excluded from redevelopment projects, right? San Francisco's experience maps on all too easily to the same kind of dynamic in other redevelopment projects across the country. Similarly, there are many reasons that Japanese American merchants were able to get their Nihon Machi project um, at a time in which the model minority image was already cohering in popular, um, in the popular imagination. But the celebration of Trans-Pacific urbanism and the selective memory that it engendered was a critical frame for understanding the municipal processes in San Francisco and the way the consequences played out. The process of commemoration and selective memory impacted African-American and Japanese-American San Franciscans daily lives by changing the very neighborhoods they lived in and the structure of opportunities um, they lived within. Thank you. Sorry, I know I went a little over, so I'm happy though to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Meredith. Um, I have a, a question or um, kind of a follow-up to um, some of the things that you brought up. So in many ways, um, redevelopment 
of Fillmore and Japantown brought together uh, segments of the community in a common struggle. And so in your, in your book, you mentioned uh, several organizations, Waco, Waypack, you know, obviously Kane and individuals that were very prevalent in this, um, in this fight. Mary Rogers, yes. Hannibal Williams, um, Yori Wada, Fred Hoshiyama, a group of people. And you're able to talk about some of the things that they actually stated or some of the things that were going on within the organization, which is not well documented. You know, you're not gonna find a lot of that in history, but how were you able to research that? And then my follow-up question is, how effective do you think organizations like Kane were in uh, uh, their, their struggle or trying to meet their objective um, during redevelopment? Um, okay, so first, how did I find instances of um, uh, cooperation or protest? Is, sorry, is that yeah, what? I mean, you're able to cite a lot of organizations during that time of redevelopment, as well as individuals. And when reading your book, you know, actually, it talks about things that people said, what was going on with the organization. So I was just interested in how you're able to research that uh, uh, that information in your book. Yeah, well, I'm so happy. So I'm seeing like Boku Kodama, Joyce Nakamura. I've seen these people in, thank you so much for coming and I can address some of your concerns um, because I've seen, you know, um, the J-Town Collective left a lot of newsletters. Um, I was part of a, um, um, so Ninjas had done a exhibit on Japantown. Um, and uh, redevelopment. Um, so, and I was part of that. So I got to interview a bunch of, of the people who are part of this. Um, and so part of it is just through talking to people, reading a lot of materials. So even though there's a lot of, a lot of this was kind of just, um, um, I mean, this is all community level grassroots organizations um, right. for both Waco and for Kane, but nonetheless, there's quite a lot of materials that both the activists themselves kind of produced, um, as well as, so Kane had its own newsletter, Waco had its own newsletter. Um, and of course, both of those were very well documented by the press because, um, you know, the press was kind of fascinated by this. Waco in particular really knew how to capture the press's attention so that they could get the attention on to displaced people's plight and conditions, right? And in the same way, Kane did that as well when they used the same kinds of very visible direct action militant tactics. Um, it was in part because it was so contrary to kind of the, the what had already become the common stereotype that, you know, Nihon Machi kind of more aligned with of cooperation um, that they were able, they too were able to get a kind of level of attention um, in part because it was so kind of contrary to, to Nihon Machi and then also to um, sort of common stereotypes. So um, there is just a lot of kind of a lot, I was very pleased to find out how much there was um, in terms of resources. So it, it was fantastic and very, Kind of rich to find not only in san francisco but also in la where there's also similar kinds of that, yeah i mean because of the relocation and then the migration of uh african americans right as part of that you know so we unique japanese americans have as neighbors and a relationship uh with the african american community here in the western edition uh the tokyo watts crenshaw right they were all um communities that had to learn to live together mm -hmm. as neighbors. Um, whereas um, I think redevelopment here in San Francisco really brought it, um, parts of the community together in their struggle of self-determination and community organizing. And um, I was just interested in uh, just how you're able to capture some of that. And, you know, I'm also interested in what you've been able or were able to find out about Kane and you know how effective they were during that oh. time period of being able to organize um, not just Sansei but Nisei um, African Americans uh, for their fight uh, during the redevelopment period. Yeah, so it's kind of hard because in a lot of ways they were coming in a little bit later, right? Um, and so these are activists that had been 
formed by um, you know, the Third World Strike in San Francisco State or um, the anti-war protests. Um, and so this was coming in, they kind of entered the conversation a little later than say Waco did. So Waco was able to um, come in a little bit more on the sort of ground floor, I think, because they were active in a period of time where they could still kind of change plans, right? So you could see this even where they, they protested. So the Kane, or sorry, Waco protested at Board of Supervisor meetings and um, at uh, San, or the Redevelopment Agency Commission meetings, right? Because they were challenging plans as they're being made. But Kane, when they came in, they were coming in maybe like five, seven years later. And so by that point, plans had already been accepted, plans had already passed. Um, and so their protests happened at places like, um, oh shoot, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a much more specific, um, like building lot board of board of at any rate their challenges could come weren't to sort of programs or projects as a whole because those had already passed you know the approval stages and had gone to funding and had gone into implementation and instead they were um, taking in some ways a much more grassroots level right sort of protecting individual buildings as they were going down preventing individual residents from being evicted um, and again of course because this was coming in at a little bit later of a stage it meant that people couldn't um, their victories were kind of ameliorating the effects, right? So you, you, you could, if you were a tenant, appeal to them because there are so few other options for you. You could appeal to them and they could help you stay in your home, you know, like another year so that you wouldn't have to keep moving until like so often the redevelopment agency would um, stop the, uh, or would evict tenants like months if not years before the actual building would go down and then another building built in its place right so the japanese center site was demolished in 19, 1959 i think and then it lay fallow for the next 10 years so you know in that time residents could have stayed in those buildings like those buildings didn't need to go down because literally it was just a fenced in lot and so kane kind of took the residents small business owners um Side in some ways, in a way that they didn't really have advocates outside to to say no, you, that you don't need this. This is building isn't going isn't scheduled for demolition for another year. Why do these people need to leave now, right? And so therefore, saving time, saving perhaps subsequent moves or multiple moves, right? And thereby also ensuring that people can find better housing, find cheaper housing, right? Than they could ordinarily if they had to like move really quickly. Okay, good. Because I think, you know, as I mentioned, the, the Fillmore really was the hub of the growth and leadership of the African American community here in San Francisco, which kind of leads into whole Black Lives Matter. And then you had groups like Kane or the Progressive that were organizing as well in terms of activism. Um, and I think those were important groups that um, were had the same goal and, and challenge in mind. You know, interesting, the Japanese Culture and Community Center is a, is a product of redevelopment. Um, in one thing I read, it said that uh, their redevelopment was giving land for a community center. So people had a place to come back to, um, which is kind of a strange statement to make because it almost in, interprets that redevelopment kicking everyone out. So the community center was around so that people could come back to. Um, but I want to turn it over to um, a lot of the folks that are listening today. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Haruka, our program manager and organizer for tonight's uh, lecture and uh, conduct the Q&A. So Hi, thank you. Hello. And, uh, again, thank you, Doctor, for such a wonderful presentation and uh, really um, every time you've, you've lectured, you've uncovered so much more information than I think many of us in the audience were ever aware of, and uh, it's just amazing to, to see your insights um, into this history. Um, so I, I do want to make sure that uh, people uh, have a chance to have their questions answered by you. And so um, I think we'll start off by um, looking at the chats um, that we've received throughout the uh, lecture so far. Um, so if folks have additional questions for Dr. Oda, you can go ahead and put them into the chat or you can um, enter them into the Q&A box. But um, I think we'll go first with a question that we got from Boku uh, Kodama about 
um, I guess the relationship between JAs and African Americans, um, you know, partly I think through uh, the redevelopment process, but I'm also interested to see if your research um, and um, your interactions with uh, some of the um, How to come man, you you're you froze in time. Oh yeah, I wasn't sure if it was me or if it was Haruka. He's just Haruka's just trying to stare us down. Well Haruka. maybe I could just I see Boku's question, so maybe I can just address it. Sorry, because I, I lost you a little bit when um I one of us froze, Haruka, when you were asking the question. Okay, so yeah, the question uh, beyond the relationship between JAs and African Americans. Uh, was um, after redevelopment, did you um, see instances of those relationships carrying uh, beyond that uh, time period? Um, oh, okay, beyond the time period of, of the- Redevelopment. Of redevelopment. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, certainly. So a lot of the, the and I know I, I didn't do a very good job in this talk of, of really bringing out the connections rather than um, so part of the point that I wanted to make was that there was real parallel tracks, there was cooperation between African American and Japanese American communities, but the redevelopment process managed to sort of separate them out and really clarify a distinction that wasn't really there, right, in terms of Japanese American and African American responses to redevelopment. Right, similar goals, similar actions, but they are sort of understood very differently. And so therefore sort of Japanese Americans and African Americans too were understood very differently. So um, I think we could sort of, I'm gonna answer that question in two ways. One, that there was a much, a large, a longer lineage of relationships between the two communities and then look to sort of what came afterwards. So um, on the one hand, like, yes. So as um, Paul had noted, right, in places like LA and Seattle, a lot of, actually really, really anywhere where Japanese Americans had been evicted during the, during the war. Um, these were segregated areas, often um, not in very good or not well upkept, right, by absentee landlords. And so those became the places, they're already segregated, those became the places where African Americans tended to live after the, or during the war when they came in, right, because they couldn't live in, um, other segregated white areas. So um, they're, you know, they had lived in the same neighborhoods. And when Japanese American returned, often um, city leaders, um, municipal officials, even observers sort of expected this. Um, I don't know, sometimes they described it as almost like a coming race riot or something between Japanese Americans and African Americans as they sort of battled for this neighborhood, which of course never happened. Not to say, and there was there was definitely racism on both sides, right? As um, African Americans and Japanese Americans sort of um, were segregated to the same area, didn't have that many options outside of it. But nonetheless, there was, um, there was not like this hostility, right? At the organizational level, the Booker T. Washington Center served Japanese American youth. Um, the YMCA that had been, or the YWCA that had been Japanese American served Black youth, right? So there was a lot of inter-organizational um, cooperation. Black members served on um, Japanese organizations, Japanese Americans served on Black organizations, right? Um, as Paul had mentioned, um, Yuri Wada was uh, worked with the Booker T. Washington um, Center, was on the board, and so forth. So um, there was a lot of cooperation, particularly at the organizational, but also at the everyday level. Like, right, kids went to the same schools. When you were walking down Post Street, you would pass both black. Um, businesses as well as Japanese American businesses. You pass a black church and a Japanese American church, right? Um, so it's to think about these. So these were very much kind of like it was, this was all happening in the same streets, on the same neighborhood, right? In the same buildings. So um, when we're faced with redevelopment, it was very much a kind of common cause, right? Um, so that kind of cooperation, that kind of just relationship had been had been had been there. Not to romanticize it again, because there was, of course, racism on both sides. Um, but that wasn't necessarily a predominant um, kind of condition on the ground. So 
going into redevelopment then that was that was there kind of that every day just sort of in the air sort of um environment and oral histories people talked about like you know you go my I had a whole bunch of friends Filipino friends black friends Japanese friends um it was just kind of part of part of the environment um and so and that continued on during redevelopment so the Nihon Machi Community Center was kind of set a slightly different tack right because it was very much um, a self-consciously Japanese American organization. Um, there was a Chinese member, there was also white members, but it was very much kind of right, just in the name, the Nihon Machi, um, was very much a self-consciously sort of Japanese and also Japanese oriented, like Japan oriented organization, right? They chose to use this Japanese name. And even though, you know, residents had long used, uh, who's Japanese speaking had long used Nihonjin Machi uh, to describe the town. This was um, a shortening of it, just Nihon Machi, Japanese town rather than, or Japan town rather than Japanese people town, right? So that set a slightly different precedent, I think. And then by the time, then when we get to Waco, of course, that was very much an interracial relationship, but because it came out of, that organization came out of black power, it very much foregrounded black leadership, black decision-making. Um, and then in a somewhat similar way, Kane did that as well, right? Because it came out of the Asian American movement, it foregrounded to some degree, um, but I think somewhat less than, right? Waco, so that was, you see like um, Freddie Powell, for example, was one of the leaders of, of Kane. He was a black grocer, I think. Um, a uh, Chinese American couple was were also members. They owned a bake shop, Wong Bake Shop. So, um, so there was, you know, these were interracial organizations in a way that I apologize for not sort of stressing a little more. Um, and then after, I think, um, as far as kind of interracial relationships after, I mean, I just track that a little bit less since it's outside of the time, but certainly it, it remained, right? Because Waco remained well, it turned into a, you know, a, a slightly different organization, but that remained with um, Yori Wada was one of the board members of Waco too. So it remained an interracial organization. Kane went through various iterations that also remained interracial um, and expressly included both black and Japanese and also poor white, which was also a large um, pop, uh, population in the district. Thank you. Yeah, that was a long answer. Sorry. No, it's fantastic, though. Thank you. Um, so our next question comes from Joyce. Um, and so she's actually uh, citing a quote from your book. Um, so I'll read the quote and then I'll ask Joyce's question as well. So uh, first of all, the quote that uh, Joyce is uh, pointing out uh, reads, uh, in contrast uh, to immigrants in Chinatown, uh, Japanese Americans moved from a distinct second place, disliked but little considered, overshadowed by the image of the noxious Chinese uh, to valued civic participants. So Joyce's question asks, uh, do you mean by this statement that the Japan Center and uh, San Francisco-Japan relations uplifted the status of Japanese Americans and therefore a positive development? No, definitely not, right? Because it's coming at the expense of other communities. So in this case, so when Japanese Americans were kind of re-racialized, in this period, it, they were done so explicitly against, right, as the model minority myth kind of did, explicitly against African Americans, right, the model minority, um, the the minority that all other people of color should be emulating in some way, right, that get ahead by sheer willpower and education rather than protest and whatnot, right? That's the whole story behind the model minority myth. So in some ways, this image of Japanese Americans is coming against a, in sort of opposition to, you know, this the, this image of African American protest, right? But it's also coming at the image of, there's another part of my book that looks at um, a similar kind of redevelopment project in Chinatown. But Chinatown at the time, there's um, an increase in refugee migration from China to the United States. And so Japan, Japanese Americans were also kind of re-racialized or reconsidered in light of sort of Chinese migration, which was often conceived of as poor and often was quite poor, um, right, low skilled, non-English speaking and so forth. So no, this is absolutely not a positive development, right, because it is coming very much at the expense of other people of color. Um, so yes, no, <laughs> this is not a positive development. Sure. 
thing. Um, so we do have a couple questions also that kind of go back a little bit before uh, the main focus of today's lecture, but uh, really around um, Japan Center Mall, right? So uh, we have a couple uh, questions from Rich. Uh, one was just in general, how large was Japantown prior to redevelopment? Uh, but also he um, asked specifically about the uh, stage at the Hotel Kabuki um, and the Kabuki Theater, uh, rather. Um, and asking, you know, didn't, didn't you see that as um, maybe the theater being before its time, uh, pointing out that it had a revolving mm -hmm. stage um, and uh, different features. But then also we have a question from Hamilton uh, who uh, mentions that growing up in San Francisco, he felt like uh, the Japan Center Mall uh, back then was livelier than it seems to be today. So uh, he's wondering what you see as the future uh, for the buildings um, in Japan Center. Um, let's see. So I'll start with the first one. Um, and I'm sorry, could you repeat that or just? Or oh, just um, asking what you see as the future uh, for the building oh. in the Japan Center. Yeah, it's so interesting because, of course, it was very much. Um, in some ways a very destructive development, right? It disrupted blocks and blocks of Japanese American, African American, Chinese American, um, Jewish American homes and businesses. Um, but it, be, it was reclaimed, right? So anything, or as, as many things can be, right? They can be damaging in their origins, but they can also be reclaimed by people, right? By activists, by community members. So over time, as you know, I'm sure many of you have gone to events and community organization events and um, fundraisers and whatnot at the Japanese Center. And um, that's because of the way people use things, right? Use buildings. So always people are using buildings, streets and whatnot, sort of in opposition or, challenging or in opposition or without care, right, to the original intent of, of building streets and so forth. And so the Japanese Center is just one example of that. So it's it's become this kind of, I mean, not without irony is kind of, as Paul had mentioned, but become a bit of a community sort of gathering place, um, site of, um, you know, community networking and so forth. And certainly there, there have been Japanese American businesses, you know, in, in the Japanese center itself. So um, part of what the future of the building is, and I know it's, it's somewhat in um, up for grabs right now, but it, it, part of it, I think is, I mean, of course, it's, this is always limited too, because this is expensive. This is a big development. It's going to depend on what capital wants to do with it. But at the same time, to some extent, it, it, some of it just depends on, you know, regardless of ownership, right? Regardless of intent of, of the development, some of it just depends on how people use it. Um, it's as a mall, it's it's not really a public space, but nonetheless, like you know, people can gather, people can um, hold events there. Um, sometimes, you know, even in contradiction to the express in, uh, desires or intent of, of building owners themselves. Um, but so part of what buildings lives are is just sort of like how people use them. Great, thank you. Um, see, we have another question and this is from Akiko and she's um, referring to the, the newsreel clip that you showed. Um, so Akiko's uh, question, she says, um, in the newsreel and uh, some of the redevelopment images that uh, you showed, uh, there are Japanese or Japanese American women in kimono with the business people. Um, so could you speak to the role of those women in regards to redevelopment and how they functioned in promoting redevelopment? Um, they, they seem to function as uh, exotic symbols in the photos mm -hmm. or video. And uh, so Akko is curious about how they were viewed. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, and this is like just part of kind of gender norms of the time, they're, they're, they're kind of as decoration, mm -hmm. right? And so what it's part one one part of my book I look at kind of the different roles of Japanese Americans in the Japanese Center the kind of more nuts and bolts part and so there was men who were lawyers for the Japanese Center investment corporations there were men of course who were the architects and the designers and the developer um, and then women and so in some ways they function as these kind of intermediaries with Japanese interests and kind of legal or I don't know economic 
ways, but and women had very different kinds of roles. Um, similar kind of as intermediaries, interpreters of Japanese, in this case, sort of more cultural um, realms, but nonetheless, um, often in ways that could be, um, that were kind of more de decorative, um, right? And they often rested on skill, right? So there was a woman who was a calligrapher who did all the, um, um, the city decided like as sort of a, sort of to emphasize the Japanese culture, did all of the contracts and the sort of major contracts and paperwork, uh, translated it into Japanese and then had both signed, right? The English language version, the official English language version, and then this kind of more um, decorative sort of Japanese version. But nonetheless, um, you know, and that was always done by this one woman, this calligrapher, who was obviously very skilled, right? And trained, um, got paid for her efforts, but so in a very different, in, in a particular different kind of role. And then also at the ceremony where that, that those paperwork were signed, um, there was a woman who was there just in a kimono simply holding the ink that the officials used, the developers used to sign it, right? So um, very much sort of in line with the times, um, women had, um, yeah, a sort of more marginal roles, um, you know, wearing kimono, taking down signs, putting up signs, um, but often in ways too that nonetheless demonstrated a real skill, a real set of training um, that was not necessarily as valued as say legal training was, but was nonetheless as, you know, as skillful, as, as um, knowledgeable, as professional in some ways, right? As dancers, as calligraphers and so forth, as uh, their male counterparts. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I know that we're um, kind of going a little bit longer than scheduled time. So out of respect for uh, folks' time and uh, certainly yours, doctor, uh, we'll close it out with one last question. And this one is actually from Rosalind at the National Japanese American Historical Society. Uh, so Rosalind, um, you know, first of all, she opens saying congratulations uh, on your seminal book and um, you know, notes that there's so much to learn from it. Uh, so Ross's question is, what lessons can be taken from um, past inter-ethnic class dynamics with developing community leaders today? Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I think things would have, would be done differently now, right? Um, than there were at the times where, um, you know, Nihonmachi, I mean, just in terms of federal regulations, Nihonmachi couldn't make, um, you couldn't have a similar kind of development without um, some attention to uh, the displaced residents in, in, in the way that was done at the time, right? Even though there were federal regulations protecting um, displaced residents who tended to be, again, segregated, people of color, low income, with few other options. Um, there were regulations in place protecting them, but they're often disregarded and there was with no consequence. And so um, certainly, I mean, just, Right, attention. So all of these groups are trying to bring attention to the displaced, to um, those with that are really marginalized and sort of damaged in long-term ways by these um, by these uh, by these upheavals. And so I think you know, obviously, one of the lessons that we should learn is is to not do, do that. Right, that that. Um, at the time, the idea was redevelopment is there to bring in outside money, and there's very little attention paid to um, to the actual residents, the people who are living in these areas, because to a city officials, those were kind of associated, those people were associated with, you know, the as they called it, blight that they were trying to eradicate. So um, certainly um, kind of a more grassroots approach, um, more attention to, and this is something that like both Waco and Kane were trying to do, more attention to actual residents, to their needs, to um, um, to, to residents' desires, right? To, to community input, to community knowledge um, that was pretty much disregarded. Okay. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so I see Paul, you've come back on. Uh, was yeah. there anything you'd like to say in parting? I'd just like to thank uh, you, Meredith, for um, doing these two lectures. I hope we can do more because, you know, your book has a lot of different information in, uh, on our more current Japantown history. I wanted to also mention that um, Kane is going to be celebrating uh, their 50th anniversary, I think, in 2023. And I'm excited because they're 
they're going to be documenting uh, their story, um, which is important uh, for young activists and future activists to know about what what happened with, um, you know, what we call young Sansei, you know, so if it's their 50th anniversary and in 2023, they're not young, that's for sure. Um, so I'm glad they're doing it now um, before, before I'm doing, I'm glad they're doing it now, but thank you, Meredith. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for your questions and your engagement. So again, yes, I just like Paul, you know, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you, doctor, for sharing with us uh, all the research you did and your insights on um, our community's history. Uh, and I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience who joined us today. Uh, we certainly um, really enjoy seeing everyone um, engaged with our programs here at the center and hope to continue to see you um, come out and support our activities and programs. So. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we do want to um, make sure everyone understands that we'll be sharing the recording of today's section, um, lecture. Uh, so you'll uh, receive um, a link to the video recording in your email, uh, but also for folks uh, who weren't necessarily able to watch today, but also uh, are still interested, uh, we will be posting the recording to our website as well as our Facebook page and our YouTube channel as well. So uh, you can certainly share the video recording of today's lecture. Uh, beyond that. Uh, but again, uh, we're really pleased with, uh, you know, the community's response to our lectures with Dr. Oda, and we hope to see you again soon for additional programs. So thank you oh, so I much. For joining. Yes. In the book. Okay, yes. Um, and also, yeah, as uh, we referred throughout the, the two lectures, uh, all this research is uh, part of uh, Dr. Oda's work in writing her book, Gateway to the Pacific, uh, Japanese Americans and the Remaking of San Francisco. And so the University of Chicago Press um, has it available for purchase online and they've actually offered a special discount uh, for folks uh, that have registered for the program um, or who have watched the lectures and would like uh, to have you know your own copy of it. So um, if you use the promo code gateway uh, when ordering um, from the University of Chicago Press, uh, you'll get 25% off of the uh, paperback edition. So uh, certainly uh, we'd love if you could support uh, Dr. Oda's writing by picking up a copy of the book yourself. And uh, we'll certainly send you another link to the purchase site. Um, so uh, please keep an eye out for that as well. So uh, with that in mind, um, you know, thank you again, everyone. And we hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture and please take care. We'll see you again soon. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.